Well, good afternoon, everyone. And can I welcome you to the Ulster Society of Chartered Accountants webinar on Northern Ireland's future energy landscape with NIE Networks. For those of you who don't know me, I am John Mathers and I am convener of the Accountants and Business Subcommittee. The subcommittee aims to ensure that the society remains relevant to and supportive for chartered accountants working in business. And we aim to do this through a calendar of events and activities aimed at educating and networking, such as this afternoon's session. We have 120 registered uh, for the session this afternoon where Gavin Walsh, Finance and Regulation Director with NIE Networks, will share some insights from their strategy, Networks for Net Zero, and how that will support the creation of a sustainable energy system for the future. For those of you who attended our half-day conference last week, hot on the heels of COP26, you will have heard from Dr. Kira Slevin of Climate Matters, who highlighted the increasing focus and scrutiny around environmental policies in all aspects of business. So we hope that this afternoon's session will give further insight and practical help to our members in addressing this important topic. We will also have Russell Smith, partner at KPMG and lead on KPMG Sustainable Future, the firm's dedicated climate and sustainability advisory practice. And Russell will touch on the key findings of their report into the impact of a move to rapidly decarbonize residential heating and transport through electrification. We will, as always, have time at the end for your questions. So please do submit any you have as we move through the session via the Q&A function on Zoom. Finally, in this virtual world, I should remind you all that these sessions are being recorded. So not wanting to take up any more time, I will now hand over to Gavin. Gavin, over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, hopefully everybody can see me okay there. I, uh... Probably just at exactly the wrong time, got a burst of sunlight over my uh, my shoulder. So hopefully that is working OK. And um, thank you for the opportunity to present. Um, you know, and thank you to the Chartered Accountants in Business uh, Subcommittee uh, for the opportunity as well. And um, I suppose when we initially set up the plan here to uh, to talk about this, uh, this subject, we had hoped to have the Department for the Economy's Energy Strategy actually published and for this to actually be a, uh, an introductory and an explanatory session around that. Fortunately, that hasn't uh, happened as of yet, but uh, we understand that that strategy is progressing and will shortly be with us. Um, however, the one thing we do know is that the changes that are required in the energy systems, which are predominantly driven by the urgent necessity to respond to climate change, uh, they won't wait, and they are going to become ever more urgent and ever more required especially as we've seen from the discussion to COP26. Um, I, I suppose what we would also say is sometimes uh, the issues that we see around climate change can sometimes feel a bit distant to us as we sit here uh, and to our daily lives. But I think there's no doubt that over the next period of time, they will impact us all. And I suppose the purpose of the session today, both for my own presentation and I think what Russell will, uh, will bring as well, is to maybe make that a little bit more real and to give some additional detail in terms of what's going to happen with that. So maybe just firstly, what I might do is move on and just give a very brief overview about NIE Networks, uh, who we are and what we do. Um, I suppose as a business, we are um, the uh, owner and manager of a lot of the electricity networks. We uh, own and manage the distribution network, which connects to every business uh, premises, farm, home in the country. Uh, and we also own the transmission network, albeit that that is owned, uh, managed by Sony. In, in doing that, we have 900,000 customers, uh, all of those end meter points. Uh, but it is important to state that we are not supplier of electricity. So we are not the person who sends the final bill to the customer. We provide the services to those companies. In doing that, we employ about 1,200 people and many hundreds more through our supply chain across the province. Um, we also, year on year, invest over £100 million in actually providing and improving that electricity service with a further contribution to the local economy of over £150 million. And that's a number that we expect to grow over the coming years. 
Uh, we are regulated by the utility regulator for Northern Ireland uh, under terms laid out uh, through legislation and by the Department for the Economy. And I suppose ultimately, you know, why are we here is ultimately our vision as a business is to deliver a sustainable energy system for all. And we fundamentally believe that the electricity network will play a key role in supporting climate action and also in delivering a net zero carbon future. And fundamentally, what we see there is that our role is to be an enabler of that energy transition and to provide a network to make it happen. It is important to say that we do not see that we have a commercial interest in selling more electricity. Um, I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and hopefully, uh, people are seeing that run through. Um, we do see that there are significant opportunities to arise in the energy transition. Um, it's obviously driven by climate change, but very much we would see that you know, there are going to be a number of other benefits to us and to our economy. Health is clearly one of those. We can see the elimination of diesel, the elimination of hydrocarbons should improve air quality and make it a kind of a, a more sustainable environment and a better and a more healthier place for us to live. We would see that that will benefit our customers, but we also see that in the coming uh, years, our economy can also benefit very significantly from the investment that will be required to make that happen. And that's part of, for instance, a submission that we've made recently to the Department for the Economy around green economic recovery. And hopefully that is something that we can continue to support over the next uh, number of years. I suppose we are asked some key questions around that. Uh, which is, can the electricity network cope with the changes that we're anticipating here? Uh, and then what are the costs and who will pay for those items? And I suppose it is important to say, yes, the network can cope, but not as it's currently laid out. It does need pure, further investment. It does need to actually be reinforced. And we do need to do things in a slightly different way in terms of the nature of some of the solutions that we have. So simply building more of everything won't be the solution here. We will require smarter solutions, some of which are already underway. In terms of the costs, I mean, Russell's uh, slide deck will cover this in a bit more detail. There are significant costs associated with that investment, but I think it's also important to recognize that these are long-term 40 plus year type investments and they will, effectively facilitate increased demand for electricity, but ultimately, and this answers the who pays element, is we believe that they will facilitate the elimination of a dependence upon externally sourced fossil fuels. And that those externally sourced fossil, fu fossil fuels being displaced will ultimately provide the funding to enable these costs to be met. But there's no doubt that there are timing issues with that, and there are areas that will need to be addressed through government policy and various supports over the next number of years to kickstart the activities that are needed here. If I kind of look at then the next piece in terms of, you know, what is the most important element in all of this, though, it's around customers. I think, you know, what we're very clear on is the driver for everything that we're doing here is not climate change per se, it's actually about what is happening to our planet and the impact that it has on everybody on that planet. And ultimately we have to take that to actually be relevant then for us in Northern Ireland. So ultimately when we look at our transition that's coming down the tracks here, we actually now need to engage with our customers and actually ensure that we understand their needs. We know things are very difficult currently for customers. Uh, the energy shock that we've seen recently in terms of significant increases in bills is very unwelcome at this point in time and obviously is happening for a variety of external market reasons, predominantly around fossil fuel prices. And um, so ultimately, I think that even creates a greater urgency for us to make the transition away from a dependence on those areas and hopefully move towards a different future, which is much more secure insofar as it can be indigenous renewables uh, supplying our indigenous demand. I think ultimately what we're looking for here though is that any of the measures that come forward need to consider a price impact. It can't be done regardless of cost, but also the most vulnerable in our society need to be supported. Part of the challenge with this is that the investments that are required sometimes are not feasible for those that have limited means and therefore they will require kind of short-term financial support 
to enable those transitions to be made. But it is important that there is a long-term payback on those items, albeit that the, the initial capital element can be submitted. But I suppose fundamentally though, the key piece is that as things stand, we have options. We do have options in terms of increasing the level of uh, renewables on our system. We have options in terms of the way we heat our homes. We have options in terms of the way we transport ourselves around. And actually the goal that we have and that we would hope most stakeholders in the province would have is about minimizing the impact of costs while actually kind of improving things for the climate as we move forward. So in that kind of context, what has NIE Networks been doing on policy? And maybe Randall, you might move forward there to the next slide for me. So uh, in the context of the Northern Ireland Energy Strategy, which we hope will be published soon, we've done quite a bit of work to actually look at um, the, what would be required in that strategy. And we've obviously identified that clean energy can be a significant growth opportunity for the Northern, Northern Ireland economy. And I believe that we're actually supported in this by both what the Department for the Economy and other arms of government have seen. Everybody, I think, has kind of heard the phrase build back better, which essentially does focus very uh, clearly on a post-COVID recovery driven by uh, green uh, investments, driven by green activity. And in line with that, we've developed a business strategy for our own business called Net Networks for Net Zero. And this calls out what we believe is required in terms of actually moving forward to support what is needed for Northern Ireland. The items are listed in the box there, and I'll kind of touch on a few of them. The first piece is joining up policy and regulation. I mean, and that might sound obvious, but the kind of the key element there for us is as a business regulated by the utility regulator and, and a very positive relationship there, we feel that there would be a benefit in expanding the mandate of the utility regulator. It's worked well in the past that they've had a kind of a very specific mandate, but as things develop and as we need to look further forward in terms of what will come for us, we believe that they need to be able to look more at future benefits as opposed to current costs. Uh, accelerating investment in renewables, we think, is an absolute requirement. That's been highlighted previously by the Department for the Economy, insofar as they're indicating a target of a minimum 70% of our uh, power to be generated from renewables. We're currently at the 40 to 50% mark, and the step forward to 70% is a challenge. I mean, there are engineering challenges associated with that, but the key element there is to be able to facilitate that. One of the areas that's within that that we would specifically call out is connections charging. Um, the policies that we have in Northern Ireland around connections, you know, are, are out of step with uh, our neighbours in the Republic of Ireland and GB. And in fact, will become further out of step as Ofgem moves towards kind of making the costs associated with connections more socialised to the broader consumer base, as opposed to the situation we have in Northern Ireland where most consumers be they consumers that are connecting to the grid or connecting to provide power as a generator, pay the bulk of the connections cost. And we feel certainly that's something that does actually need to be looked at strongly. We also need to, to look at the, the network infrastructure and rather than building on an as needs basis, which is what we've done in the past, we need to actually anticipate future requirements. And that's really in particular where the, the change in mandate for the UR would be very helpful to help us look further and further ahead to make sure that the network can be ready for what is coming down the tracks, but also to make sure it is quicker and easier to connect to our network. And then obviously aligned with that is improving the planning process. It may sound obvious, but actually the planning process is a critical enabler to actually being able to make the changes that we need. And what we're finding in the planning process here is for all manner of really good reasons, it is quite a slow process, but actually it does need to speed up. It does need to improve because it will become a blocker to the required changes that are, are needed. And then alongside those is accelerating low carbon transport and the modern, modernization of building regulations, particularly around efficiency and heating requirements in those buildings because we would see a very significant element of our fossil fuel production at the moment outside of the agriculture sector is actually in space heating in premises. And actually a significant improvement can be made if we address those areas. And maybe if we move on uh, to the next element, I suppose as we look at 
what might come down the tracks. Um, but we've looked at, I suppose, is well, how will the networks for net zero policy uh, be developed? And what we've had to say is electrification is not the only answer here. I mean, I think we, we have to be very clear about this. There is a place for other fuels. There is a place for other mechanisms to actually support the requirements for our energy future. But we see electrification as being the absolutely key mechanism for decarbonization. And I think uh, the KPMG report that's referenced here that, uh, that Russell will present will, I think, demonstrate some of the kind of the, the benefits around that. We've also looked at the options around hydrogen. We definitely see kind of a benefit in developing a hydrogen economy. But the important piece is that there's still work to be done to develop hydrogen solutions at scale. And we don't have quite that degree of time to actually be able to move forward in decarbonization. But definitely, hydrogen is going to be a part of the future energy mix. And then in particular, what we've also done is we've actually looked at kind of uh, with uh, Accenture, some of the, the actual changes that might be required to support those 2030 climate targets. And maybe what I might just do is touch on the next couple of slides just on you know, a couple of kind of key takeaways from those reports. Firstly, in terms of KPMG, and I'm not going to steal Russell's thunder, um, you know, but really, I suppose what you can see on that slide is very significant opportunity, both in the creation of jobs, in the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. And by the way, the 82% that's referenced there in reduction of greenhouse gas emissions, that's what effectively laid out in the UK's overall uh, net zero carbon strategy. And that's what Northern Ireland will have to achieve. So it's not quite 100% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and that's to reflect the fact that we have a very significant agricultural base that we do need to look at because food security is also going to be important in the future. But the key element there is this displacement of external fossil fuels. And obviously then what that will do is generate opportunities through that investment to deliver improved uh, performance in our economy. I also maybe wanted to kind of move away from that macro element for a second to actually talk then about you know, specifically on what will all of this mean for us as consumers and businesses. And I think the Accenture report where they lay out a number of the areas is a really useful snapshot to actually be able to kind of put some of that into context. You know, if I start in the top left about power system decarbonization, obviously we want to kind of to see power being generated not from coal and oil and gas uh, in the future, albeit that gas will be an important fuel given its efficiency and its ability to actually provide quick support for intermittent renewables. But what we do want to see is an increase in the amount of wind and solar on our system aligned with storage. That is the other piece of this that's really, really important. And for businesses and consumers, those are also elements which will be important in terms of their own power requirements and in their own, uh, their own needs. The decarbonization of light duty transport, that's effectively you know, calling out the transition to electric vehicles, which will be required. EVs are not going to be the panacea. You can see it that in terms of heavy duty transport, those will still rely on kind of fuel blends, which actually will not be kind of pure electric. There may be more hydrogen, there might be biofuels and other items. But ultimately, we do need to see a transition away from diesel and petrol towards those lower carbon fuels. But in particular, for those areas where we're starting to see greater choice around EVs in particular, you know, to actually start to enable that transition. And in that context, we, we welcome the recent announcements uh, that have come through from the Department for Infrastructure about investments in the electricity, in the electric charging networks, uh, the public networks. I think, again, that is a really important signal and a very important enabler to actually see a greater transition there as well. Decarbonization of housing, as I mentioned at the start, a huge amount of our emissions are actually coming from the use of oil and gas to heat our homes. And actually, part of the problem is most of our homes are not very well insulated. So we lose an awful lot of that heat. And the greatest efficiency that we can make in business and as consumers is actually improving the insulation in our properties to make them better at retaining the heat that is actually used to produce them. If we then align that with the use of heat pumps, which for every one unit of gas produce three to four units of heat, then I think actually there's a real opportunity for us to actually be able to significantly reduce that element of, uh, of carbon usage. 
However, it is important to recognize it won't always be the situation that people can move straight to heat pumps. There will still be a role for gas for some properties, and there will still be a role there to actually hopefully over time replace that gas with biomethane or other fuels that are kind of more renewable source. Decarbonization of industry follows around the same area, but I think it's important to recognize here the trend we're seeing internationally and that we're starting to see kind of in Northern Ireland as well is the, the idea of embedded generation where people are producing their own power and consuming it on site. And those elements in terms of kind of greater on-site generation uh, and hopefully using kind of, again, lower carbon fuels, using renewables, using, uh, you know, various other sources aligned with storage, we believe can make a very significant improvement in terms of actually decarbonizing. And then agriculture, which is obviously a thorny issue given the scale of the emissions that it actually produces for Northern Ireland and the importance of Northern Ireland's agriculture sector to the overall economy. I think it's recognized in the climate bills that we can't fully eliminate that. And obviously we can't, or we haven't yet found a solution for the methane produced particularly from animal herds. But again, there are opportunities there, even things like the anaerobic digestion of manure and slurry to actually produce energy. You know, those are components that we looked at. Chicken litter, you know, again, is being used in some instances to actually produce heat. Uh, there are a variety of mechanisms out there whereby we can reduce emissions in the agriculture sector. And I suppose maybe if I move to the next slide, I mean, you know, just what does this mean for business? I mean, obviously there's a huge amount of items out there in terms of implications and opportunities. You know, the piece that I'd start with is probably skills. You know, there's a range of traditional skills in electrical activity, plumbing activity, uh, you know, fitting, jointing, all of those kind of traditional craft skills that we need to retain. But a huge amount of new skills in terms of data analytics, programming, electrical engineering, electronic engineering, and all of the various skills around that in terms of being able to deal with an increased scale of kind of a renewables generation and heating. Those items are kind of are really important. And we've been banging the drum with the Department for the Economy about the need to recognize this issue and to make sure that we're making provision for that in the future. I call out prosumer there as well, as I mentioned, this idea of producing the energy that you consume, uh, you know, is what's behind a prosumer. That doesn't have to be buildings for uh, industrial purposes. It can be individuals as well. You see it in a lot of farmlands uh, where actually they have wind turbines or, or solar panels. And again, they may not be an exact match for their energy needs, but those are definitely important areas and things that will continue to be to be done in the future, including on a community base. So, you know, again, what we see in other jurisdictions is it isn't just down to the individual. In some cases, communities are banding together to make these uh, these uh, markets for themselves. Collaboration is also something I'd call out here. Again, I said at the start. Electricity is not the only solution. We will look at whole system solutions. So integration with the hydrogen economy, integration with storage solutions, integration also, I suppose, really with, with businesses and consumers, because one of the areas here that we would recognize is that demand side management, as it's called, so effectively being able to moderate the electricity that people use is going to be really important in the future. And we have some elements of that already in place, but that will become important. So that kind of collaboration to make sure that we're working together to try and find solutions is something that will be called out. And finally, I suppose the piece around governance I'd call out too, and I mean, maybe just moving to the next slide, it's one of those areas where when we think and talk, and for this audience in particular, we obviously have reporting requirements which are expanding. Um, you know, the risks and challenges around climate change are being more and more recognized. And again, those are having to be called out in financial reports. They're kind of being called out uh, for investors. And, you know, again, there's a plethora of requirements that are, that are coming forward on those. And I think, again, Russell will cover that in a bit more detail in his presentation. But again, just an important one that for us as a business in terms of NIE networks, we're actually certainly uh, having to provide a lot of this information it's information which we would want to provide anyway because it's useful for both our sustainability purposes and also to deliver our overall vision. But again, we recognize that it is something that people need to adapt to. So, you know, what does that all mean and what are the next steps associated with this? 
Um, you know, I, I suppose really the, the key for us in NIE Networks is we recognize that we've been on a journey for a period of time around this, and um, you know, moving forward with various mechanisms to improve the quality of our network and to make it more supportive of what needs to be done. But also, I suppose, you know, COP26 and everything that's come out of that has actually really highlighted maybe some of the urgency around it. And I suppose in our view, this is not a challenge that has just a purely technical solution. There are a variety of approaches that are going to need to be taken on this. We're clear that we're not the only party that actually has solutions here. We can't uh, ignore the customer in this as well. The impact of all of this on everybody in society is going to be very significant. And we need to ensure that those requirements and the needs and the, I suppose, the timeline that our customers need for this is recognized and understood. But the key of it is there's a huge opportunity there to be, to be seized. And ultimately, what we need is action now to seize that opportunity. So thanks for that opportunity, John. Maybe I'll hand back to you and you can uh, bring Russell in. Yep, thank you very much, uh, Gavin. I was really interested in the, the, the opportunity and the need to seize the opportunity. Um, I'll now introduce um, Russell Smith. Um, as I mentioned, Russell is partner at KPMG and leads on their climate and sustainability advisory practice, KPMG Sustainable Futures. Russell will touch on both the wider environmental challenges and on KPMG's report, which looked at the impact of a move to electrification. And again, just a reminder, um, I would encourage you to make the best use of our expert speakers this afternoon. So please do submit any questions you have via the Q&A function on Zoom, and we will pick them up at the end during the Q&A panel. But for now, Russell, over to you. Uh, thanks, thanks, John. Good afternoon, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Great to be able to speak with you today. I'm going to speak for around uh, 20 minutes, um, and I'm going to split this uh, presentation into, into two parts. The second half will, will very much complement Gavin's discussion there, and, and uh, uh, given the outputs of a a piece of analysis that we were commissioned looking at the economics of, of the decarbonisation journey. What I'm going to do, though, just at the front end is, is start slightly higher on a more macro level and just look at the broader ESG agenda and potentially more significantly the, the climate agenda, and which is really underpinning you know, all of the moves that we're going to be talking about on, on electrification and decarbonisation uh, more generally. Um, for context, I sit within a, a team which we established in KPMG around two years ago. Um, it's called KPMG Sustainable Futures. And we developed it uh, purely on the back of the increasing demand from our own customers who are asking, we see the ESG agenda, the climate agenda uh, growing. We know we have to do something, but we don't know quite what to do. And so really, you know, we're developed our, our proposition, which is now 25 full-time uh, team members uh, the largest in the country, uh, to help corporates navigate it. I'm going to, going to start then the first slide just on COP26. It's you know, fairly topical and, and fairly recent. Uh, Gavin referenced it briefly. One of the questions we're often asked is, was COP26 a success or was it blah, 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 as, as uh, Greta Thunberg would have, have said? I think it depends what lens you, you use to look at it. If you'd expected a two-week conference in Glasgow to solve all of the world's challenges, you were ultimately going to be very disappointed. If you looked at it though, uh, on a different lens, you know, I was actually just taken aback and amazed by what it achieved. Um, first of all, sort of net zero climate plans. By the end of COP, we had 151 countries declaring a net zero plan. That covers 90% of the global economy. Given that I can't get my three kids to agree what movie to watch on Netflix, getting 151 countries to coordinate, you know, is, is just a remarkable feat. Uh, that's versus 17 back in 2019. Uh, and just the sheer number of countries that have mobilized in this agenda, you know, can't leave you in any doubt that we have a real issue and a real challenge and a real problem uh, that needs to be addressed. One of the big pieces of COP26 was moving the agenda from 2050, which has been the, the main focus of, of the world, to 2030. And really, the, the big challenge is people committing to 2050 doesn't mean an awful lot because those who are committing to it ain't going to be around uh, by 2050. So a lot of COP is actually getting people to put in place 2030 plans. And we're going to see that also at corporate level. If you're a corporate, going along as a board committing to 2050 um, isn't going to be seen as enough. You're going to have to show earlier 
commitments and commitments that are measurable and you're going to be actually accountable for. The second big success of COP26 was what's called the new international sustainability standard. So ISSB uh, is going to come out and effectively it's going to replace what we call the alphabet soup of standards. So at the moment, corporates are reporting against a plethora, you know, more than 50 different sustainability standards and reporting frameworks. And that just makes it impossible to actually benchmark. It allows people to very easily greenwash. And so ISSB is going to have a single standard unified, which is going to show reporting on a like for like basis. And that's going to be a pretty much of a game changer. And then the final thing I just highlight from COP26, which, which really amazed me, was the amount of corporate commitment. COP itself was primarily a getting together of the nation states. But what we saw actually was the corporates, the corporate world mobilizing as much, if not more. And given that corporates account for 85% of all global emissions, we're not going to solve this unless there's corporate action as well. Um, and what we've seen is corporates moving ahead quite often of what the regulatory demand is. And probably the best example of that was 130 trillion of capital from 450 institutions committing uh, to pursuing the net zero uh, by 2050 objective. And again, that wasn't asked for, it wasn't demanded of them, but it was corporates stepping up uh, to the agenda. In terms of, of the climate agenda, what the single thing that's amazed me most has been the speed of change. So climate agenda and you know things such as melting polar caps and, uh, and acid rains and all those environmental have been about for decades. Um, what we've seen though is that more has happened in the last 12 months than the two decades before it. And in fact, over COP, I'd say more happened in the two weeks than the 12 months and the 20 years before that. It's the speed of change is just remarkable. One of the questions is why has this become such a focus and why is this now firmly on the corporate agenda? We, KPMG does an annual uh, CEO survey and three years ago, climate wasn't even on the top 10. Two years ago, it was number four or five and it is now the number one on the corporate CEO agenda. Uh, and the question is, why is that? And I think the answer is that historically, the climate and the ESG agenda was seen as a CSR issue. It was a good thing to do, just a bit of tokenism to be seen to be part of your, your local community. What's changed is that this is no longer a CSR issue. This is now a real strategic financial issue. And it's as simple as this, this agenda has so much momentum, so much uh, change happening, that if you are a corporate on the wrong side of this agenda, you will have negative financial impact, if not financial ruin. Uh, some corporates are absolutely at the forefront of this. A great example I would use is Ford Namona in the Republic of Ireland, the business whose sole purpose was to dig up um, peat and burn it. They have now completely pivoted their business away from that because that business has just no purpose in a net zero world. And they're now a climate solutions company building wind farms, uh, et cetera, across the country. So, so the, the change is immense and it's uh, impacting everyone. If we look at the key drivers of this agenda for, for corporates, uh, so this is corporates in Northern Ireland, corporates uh, globally. The first one is regulation. The sheer volume of regulation on this agenda is just immense. Uh, and almost every piece of legislation and regulation that comes out is now bringing a, a climate or an ESG lens to it. If you stand though at a macro level, what are the regulators looking to do? The overall aim of the EU and the UK regulation is to reorientate capital. So it is looking to reorientate capital away from corporates that are not sustainable and reorientate it to those that are sustainable. That is to make it easier to access and cheaper to access. And for those that are not on the agenda, harder and more expensive. And they're doing that in two ways. First of all, they're saying that corporates at the moment are not disclosing enough to let investors or stakeholders recognize or understand if they are sustainable and in line with the net zero trajectory. And so a lot of the regulation uh, that Gavin mentioned, even the corporate reporting and corporate sustainability reporting is all about increasing the amount of scrutiny and the amount of information that's provided. Interesting, the actual lens is changing. So historically, a corporate sustainability report focused on the impact a corporate or a business has on the environment, the amount of plastic they recycle or the amount of effluent they discharge. There's a very much a change here. It's now not about that. It's about how the environment is going to impact your company and that's the climate risk so as the climate agenda progresses as regulation changes corporates are going to start being impacted 
both by physical changes in the environment and by the regulatory changes. And, and what the government and the regulators want corporates to actually disclose how at risk their business is from the climate agenda and how they are addressing it. For example, we have just taken on a mandate for one of the largest corporates in Ireland, and we're quantifying in euros the risk of 148 different factories across 50 countries and the change and the economic quantification of risk for changing consumer appetite for their products. And that's going to be a big trend that we see going forward. The second trend is, again, on the finance side, is to force lenders and providers of capital to change who they allocate their capital to. And so banks, for the first time now in the UK and across Europe, are now having to categorise. So Danske Bank, Ulster Bank, Bank of Ireland, they now have to categorise their, their loans. They have to be able to categorise, are they green, are they brown? And they're going to, eventually, we're going to see they're going to have to hold more capital against loans that are not deemed to be uh, sustainable. And that's going to make it more expensive. And that's how we're going to see the banks reorientating how they focus. The second big trend then is investors. So similar here, the investors are under pressure. If you're a BlackRock or a Blackstone making investments um, in corporates, they are now applying very strong lenses. You need to demonstrate that your business is climate compatible. It is aligned with the right agenda or we will not invest in your business. We're now, as KPMG, getting a lot of demand for what's called ESG due diligence. And when the company is coming in to buy or do M&A, they're now bringing a new lens as to whether they do that transaction. The third one is probably the most significant one for the Northern Ireland SME market. So regulation at the moment has primarily focused on largest corporates in the land, the PLCs. Does that mean then that if you're a, a medium-sized Northern Ireland company, this isn't really relevant for you? The answer is not at all, and supply chain is where you're getting it. So if you're a large corporate, you're going to be under pressure to decarbonize your business. The vast majority of your emissions are probably what's called your scope three, so your suppliers and the goods and services that you work with. So what's happening is the large corporates are then pushing it down onto their suppliers. Those suppliers are pushing it down, and we're seeing that cascading uh, down. I'll give you an example. Last week, we had spoken with a Northern Ireland business about a year ago on this agenda. There is a supplier in the, uh, sort of the construction industry. And at the time, they said, look, really interesting discussion. But to be honest, we don't buy into it. We don't think it's relevant for us. No one's ever raised it. We think it sounds a bit like scaremongering. We got a call from them just last week saying our complete lens has changed on this. There is now not a week goes by that we are not getting customers phoning up asking us on this agenda or our compliance for our products. And we are now actively losing business because of this and have now engaged us to come and help them develop a response. And that's just a brilliant example from my of how this agenda has moved even in the last 12 months and is impacting every uh, corporate uh, uh, and of every scale. The final one I just touch on is consumers. This one's really surprising. The one trend that we're not really seeing is consumers fundamentally changing their buying uh, power or their demand. If you go into Belfast and survey a random 100 people, around 70% would say they want to buy sustainable products. In reality, only 20% of those will actually be willing to pay any more or do anything different. That's going to change eventually. It's not the main driver at the moment. But when it does change, um, if you're a business and you're able to connect into the 70% who want to do sustainable purchasing but aren't currently, if you're able to find a way of bridging that expectation or, or, or gap, then there's a huge business opportunity uh, for you in that agenda. So moving on now to, to, to the, the decarbonization agenda more specifically, this is just a graphic that shows what we need to do. So the, 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 the uh, blue bar is, is the UK emissions, and they've been fall, falling quite consistently from 1990s downwards. Northern Ireland, which is the purple bar, our emissions have actually been rising um, in recent years. Now, they've started to fall again now, um, but there's obviously an awful lot of way to go. One of the things Gavin uh, flagged in his presentation there is, um, while net zero is the target of the UK, there is uncertainty as to what Northern Ireland is going to actually achieve. Um, at the moment, you know, they, there's two rival bills going through uh, the Assembly, one looking for 100% decarbonisation and one looking at 82%. The difference, as Gavin said, is agriculture. Uh, we recently did a study on the decarbonisation of agriculture, and it's scary how challenging it is to actually decarbonise our agricultural sector. We can decarbonise about 20% of it with known, known technologies. 
to decarbonize the rest of it, the only way to do it is cut the herd. And our calculations suggest that to get the herd down enough to reach net zero in agriculture, you would have to be at a level pre the potato famine. So that's just an absolute decimation of the agricultural sector. So it does show some parts of the economy are really, really challenging. What is interesting though, is that we do have um, uh, some technologies that are proven and are able to decarbonize today. And one of those, uh, which we've done the study for NIE on is electrification. So if you look at the emissions of Northern Ireland, you can see it's broken into sort of six, uh, five or six key categories. Agricultural I've touched on, and it's obviously a big one. It's our big, big problem in Northern Ireland. However, the other big ones of residential um, heating, so that's heating the homes, transport, uh, which is our, our vehicles, uh, energy supply, uh, so our lighting into homes, and, and business energy use, which a lot of that is, is, is thermal. What is very helpful is that we do have a known and proven technology uh, to decarbonize those. So they can all be addressed with electrification. And that's why electrification is such an interesting technology. It is able to address four of our biggest buckets um, of, of emissions, and each of them can be done with proven technologies. Now, they may cost a lot, but at least money can solve the problem. For agriculture at the moment, money can't even solve that problem. So let's just look through these key three sectors and what does it look like from an economic perspective? So first of all, power generation. So this is you know, the, the single uh, biggest piece. We're now going to be moving uh, a lot of our, uh, our emitting sectors over to electric. And if you look here, the trend, so the height of the bar is the amount of, of electrical generation in the country. Historically, Northern Ireland's electrical generation demand uh, has been fairly consistent. It has grown a little bit, but it's been fairly flat. If you look at the direction of this graph, there's a very strong upward trajectory now. And that is because we're now not only asking for electricity to power the lights and, and our, our appliances we plug in, we're now asking them to decarbonize and to, to run our transport and our heating. And so you've got a very dramatic increase in overall electricity demand. The, the target we've looked at is trying to get 80% of that growing demand or production of electricity to come from renewables. We're about 45% today and it has been one of Northern Ireland's real success stories. So we think it's eminently achievable. What it does need is another 5.4 gigawatts or a total of 5.4 gigawatts of renewable energy by 2040. So that is gonna be uh, more than doubling the amount of wind uh, on land that we already have. It's gonna be building a number of offshore wind farms and it's gonna be ruling out an awful lot more solar. But all of those are proven. We've done it already. And it's just about making the necessary investment, reinforcing the grid uh, and getting them built. And we can very easily then decarbonize at least 80% of that renewable electricity, uh, which will then flow into power the rest of the economy. The second one is, is transportation. And, and the graph here uh, shows a lot slower penetration of this. So what we're saying is that by 2040, there's going to be around 1.4 million vehicles in Northern Ireland. Um, the ability to decarbonize those is really switching over to electric. What we're saying is that we're not going to make very fast inroads really until 2025. Uh, over the next few years, we're going to see an increased penetration. But until 25, we're still going to have the vast majority still going to be ICE cars. Um, post 25, north of 30% of new purchases are going to be electric vehicles. And post 2030, where there's going to be a ban, you know, the vast majority of new vehicles are going to be uh, electric. And that's when you're going to see the real penetration accelerate. We're going to obviously have to invest in a huge amount. So we're saying over half a billion of investment in, in electric charging points, et cetera, over five and a half thousand are going to be needed across Northern Ireland. And then the final one is heating. And the heating is, is probably the least spectacular um, in terms of impact. And that's just the sheer challenge. So while we have a proven technology to decarbonize heating, it doesn't make it easy or, or, or fast to deploy. And this is effectively taking out oil-fired burners out of homes or gas burners out of homes and replacing them with heat pumps. The slight challenge to do that is that you have to upgrade the fabric of the home at the same time. You have to actually physically reduce the amount of, of heat needed by energy efficiency measures 
and that just makes it slow uh, and sluggish. It can be done, it is uh, doable, um, but what we're saying is that it's gonna be a, a lot slower rollout um, than we've seen in electric vehicles or even the, the, the greening of the electricity more generally. So we're going to get to around 375,000 homes by 2040 that have heat pumps. The other piece you see from this is the actual height of the bars are reducing over time. So as well as decarbonizing the, the actual heat that's going into the homes, we're reducing the amount of heat that's needed because of these energy efficiency measures. And so we do achieve quite a decarbonization by 2040, um, but you know, it is gonna probably be our most challenging. And it's also gonna be the area that we're gonna really need to skill up. That is an awful lot of construction jobs, a lot of skilled laborers to do the retrofits on homes uh, to make them compatible with the heat pumps. So what does the economic um, impact of, of these changes look like? So in total, um, we're going to have to invest about 9.5 billion uh, between now and 2040 to enable this. The single biggest investment is gonna be large scale renewables. So this is the funding to put wind farms, offshore and solar on the system. Um, that's around 3.2 billion. We're gonna then spend around 2.8 billion on the energy efficiency measures um, and heat pumps. So that's the upgrades to homes and the installation of, of heat pumps in the houses. Uh, and then there's around 1.7 billion, uh, which will be used for uh, the power networks. This is NIE's investment in the wires and the systems to allow this increased power to flow around the system. In terms of, of the vehicles, we reckon there's about 230 million of incremental spend um, to buy EVs. That's where the EVs up to 2030 are still going to be at a premium cost to ICE. Post-2030, um, it's going to be pretty much in line with the spending that we've spent on ICEs anyway. Um, one of the implications is that we're going to be spending an awful lot less on fossil fuels. And so by 2040, we're going to be spending about 1.4 billion a year less on fossil fuels. And that's going to be funding then that's, that's going to be kept in digitally. We're not going to be importing uh, fossil fuels, and that's going to help provide the funding and, and the, the ability of people to, 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 to cover this energy transition cost. Uh, we're also going to be saving over half a billion a year just by needing less heat, even just to heat our homes. Um, in terms of, of economic impact, there's going to create an awful lot of jobs. So we see, see a sustained 5,000 jobs being created to actually deliver this. We're going to see some peaks. So there's some peaks as we install um, part of the network as we install heat pumps, um, but they're going to be a fairly consistent level of employment. And as Gavin referenced, a lot of new skills needed to actually deliver upon this. One of the benefits of investment, of course, is that it has multiple uh, benefits across the system. If we spend the 9.6 billion, that's going to stimulate other parts of the supply chain, the suppliers of the suppliers, and the multiplier effect uh, we're going to get is very strong in this in this particular analysis. It's going to generate about 18.8 billion of GVA uh, to the Northern Ireland economy. And that just shows while the decarbonisation agenda is often painted as a cost and a burden, um, it is actually going to be a real economic stimulus as long as it is done in a just way and a just transition and that people and uh, fuel poverty are protected. And that's you know a priority of, of government. The final sort of piece I would, I would highlight, the move to electrification is also uh, brings a lot of environmental benefits outside of just decarbonisation. So it does reduce the amount of nitrogen oxides in the air, the amount of particulates coming out of vehicles, and the amount of sulphur dioxide. So effectively, it will result in a statistically important improvement in air quality in Northern Ireland. So in terms of, of a conclusion, so the wider ESG and climate agenda is going to impact every single business in Northern Ireland. Even if the regulation doesn't absolutely capture you, the supply chain is, you're going to have to respond at some point. And the question just is, is how you respond and when you respond. It's going to lead to, to investment leading growth, um, the 9.6 billion that's going to be invested. It's going to help address the key challenge of greenhouse gas emissions. It's going to have an immediate impact um, on a scale of change that no other investment um, area that we've seen in recent decades will come close to. And it's going to bring broader benefits of economic, of environmental, of air quality alongside it. So generally, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be hard to fund uh, and to get all the policies right. 
but it is going to be transformational in a positive way. Thank you very much. Super, thank you very much, um, Russell, for that. That was uh, really interesting. And I think the bit, the bit that struck me was the, the pace of change and, and, and looking at your various graphs, the, the pace of change isn't going to slow down. And I'm interested in just seeing the, the change in perspective of that company that you were speaking to who maybe didn't see it so relevant uh, 12 months ago and, and, and now it's front and centre kind of thing. So look, uh, we, we'll now move to the Q&A panel. Um, and before we do so, I'd just like to welcome on Randall Gilbert. Randall is the head of network strategy for NIE Networks. Um, so maybe, um, folks, if you want to turn your cameras and your microphones on, Gavin, uh, Randall, and Russell, we'll, we'll just move into to the Q&A. Russell, or sorry, Randall, I'll, I'll maybe come to you first and just give you an opportunity to briefly introduce yourself and any initial comments or observations from the presentations. Yeah, thank you, John. Um, no, very, very interesting, and thanks very much for giving the opportunity to, to uh, you know, speak at, at this forum um, and, and and take questions and answers. I mean, I think I think you know the two presentations were quite complementary. You know, we, we, we sort of started you know recently with COP and what's coming out of that, and certainly the the key takeaway for me was the ability or, or the need now to get past the talking and actually you know deliver on the ground because time is running out. You know. We talk about 2030 deadlines and three decades, you know, to 2050, but we're two, we're nearly two years into this decade. There's a need now, you know, to take action. Um, you know, flowing through from that, probably, you know, the lack of having any sort of legislation in Northern Ireland at the minute or or a, a published energy strategy is probably holding us back a bit. You know, we need to get some direction there. Certainly, that that would be helpful. But things are happening on the ground, and you know, there are changes happening, and and to a certain extent, where leadership can be given from industry and from 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 the bottom up. You know there are there are shoots that, that that is actually happening now. So, you know, Russell spoke there about the electrification and and the importance of that. And you know, the EU have published a strategy uh, called Powering a Climate Neutral Economy, and it talks about it's a strategy for system integration. And you know, it is going to be a whole system approach. There will be you know electrification. There will be hydrogen in the mix. There will be you know the you know changes in customer behaviour in terms of energy efficiency as education you know develops there. But you know there are certainly you know elect electrification and, and how we decarbonize the, the you know the transport sector, the heating sector, and you know the, the progress with made in renewables. It's a 2020 technology. It's here today, and I think if we're going to have a chance, you know, to hit the 2050 targets, it's an area we really need to consider about how we actually progress now. You know, to to affect those changes. So anyway, I think see some interesting questions coming through. I'll let I'll hand back to you if you want to uh, sort of yeah. address those, nope. John. Thank you, Randall. And, and, and folks, I will just say I'm, I'm conscious it's sort of 24 minutes past. We, we have only a few minutes, but look, we, we have a number of good speakers on and, and a number of attendees. So uh, I appreciate if, if you do have to move on at half one, uh, drop off, but we maybe will run over for five minutes just to, to make sure that we cover it because there, there, there is a lot of a good engagement on this. Randall, just, uh, I'll come back to you if that's okay and, and maybe ask you to pick up on, on this first question, uh, specifically on will NIE be developing any storage solutions or is that the role of the generators? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a, an interesting one. Currently, under our current license conditions, uh, NIE Networks isn't permitted to own uh, batteries, uh, battery facilities. It's at the, at the current, I mean, batteries connect onto the onto the network for two purposes. One is to actually charge, in which case they're acting in a demand type role, and then they're there, there to put energy back into the grid, you know, in a generation type role. Presently, uh, they're viewed as a as a generator, and uh, and we're not permitted to own generation. We don't have a generation license, um, so that is something that you know potentially could change. You know, certainly we see that uh, batteries and battery storage is part of the solution because it helps us to shape the demand profile on the network and helps us optimize that grid and minimize any reinforcement costs to, to enable, enable the transition. So definitely it's, 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 it's a tool in the toolbox. It's part of the solution, but just at the, at the, at the way that, that we're uh, legislated at the minute, um, we're, we're not permitted to, to own or develop battery storage. Interesting, thank you. Uh, Russell, I'll maybe come to you for this second question and, and I suppose it's around the speed of the transition. So I'll, I'll just read the question out. Is it the case that we are moving too hastily away from fossil fuels to meet our decarbonisation targets without a viable alternative in terms of renewables? 
wind energy can't be produced on windless days, for example? Should we be looking beyond wind and solar to something like renewable crops? Yeah, look, I think it's, it's a very good question because it's very timely. We've had a, a situation recently where we have had periods of, of low wind and and you know while while that hasn't caused the the current energy prices the crisis you know it's certainly been a a, a factor in, in in the mix i think th there definitely does need to be um you know a, a much broader response on the energy transition it isn't just about building wind turbines you know battery storage was just referenced there we are putting battery storages you know into the irish system uh, there's a rule for hydrogen uh, as well which is you know acts as a medium to, to store energy um in the intermittent uh, pieces um, the, the the general decarbonisation uh, journey, and as referenced, I think by by Gavin and by Randall, is it's not one technology; it has to be a mix. So the likes of of renewable gas, which comes from you know, potentially from the crops that was uh, referenced in the question there, renewable gas absolutely will play a part um, in the mix, and it's about getting all these technologies together to complement. And you know, if we did head head on without looking at a holistic view. We definitely would be setting ourselves up for an issue um, when the certain resources aren't blowing or, or shining. Super. Thank you, uh, Russell. Gavin, I'll, I'll come to you for th this next question. And, and look, you, you mentioned about collaboration and the need for collaboration in, in, in your presentation. So um, th this question reads, do you think the structure for collaboration uh, needs formalised in Northern Ireland? Or should it be left to network operators, producers, and generators, etc., across the energy systems to organise this themselves? What is your view on the proposal for a new future system operator in GB being responsible for strategic planning across both gas and electricity systems? Yeah, the um, I, I think on the collaboration side, I mean, one of the benefits that we've seen of, out of the energy strategy process is that actually. A lot of the kind of the participants in the sector have, you know, been engaged in that and have actually been talking to one another. Um, you know, we do expect, and it was a component of the kind of the recent Sony price control, that there will be whole systems approaches, you know, kind of adopted. So we do expect that there will be kind of future requirements on all license holders, particularly in the regulated businesses, to talk to one another, to understand each other's plans and to make sure that those are being adopted. Um, you know, in terms of mandating that in a particular structure versus kind of allowing that to develop, because not, you know, not all elements will be exactly the same. I, I, I do think there is a benefit in having those channels of communication open, but I, I, I'm probably agnostic at this point in time in terms of exactly how that would be done. But there definitely does need to be collaboration between the parties. You know, if I, if I segue from that into the future system operator kind of question, I think um, you know we see the the real value in that kind of system operator role as kind of as being at a kind of a, at a an overall transmission level as we would call it. So the kind of the overall system needs and demands. And there's definitely a kind of a benefit in having an overview there, which at the moment is carried out by by Sony on the electricity system here. We are in our own role evolving into a distribution system operator, and that's a subtly different role because it, it talks more about individual solutions and it talks more about individual components in the, the network. And it's much more uh, around how your network and the kind of the solutions around that will evolve. So that doesn't always sit very well with that overview strategic planning kind of role as well. But I, I, I think it, it all feeds back to this piece that there does need to be greater integration in the kind of in the different elements of transmission, distribution, overall planning, et cetera. And that also feeds through into the integration and, and support then that we get from the regulator and also from the kind of the, the government, I suppose, the, the Department for the Economy and others. There needs to be a kind of a, a greater sense of you know working together to try and achieve on the areas there. Again, does it need a future system operator kind of role? I think we would spend as much time getting it set up as we would actually kind of just cracking on and getting on with the stuff that we need to do. So anyway, that's a, that's a personal view on that. Okay, thank you, Gavin. Uh, we, we have just hit ha half one, so I'm, I'm going to move the Q&A panel into a quick fire question now. Um, so, folks, uh, I, I, I'll not be overly harsh, but let, if we can try and cover off as many as we can, because there are a lot of good questions here. So, um, Russell, going to come to you on, on this next one, and I suppose it's around why Northern Ireland is lagging in terms of offshore wind. So, again, I'll quickly read the question. 
An article last week had ROI offshore wind as 5,000 uh, megawatts projected by 2030. And in an earlier slide, it was 500 for Northern Ireland. Why the disparity? What are the main reasons for NI lagging behind? Yeah, so in the Republic of Ireland, just generally on the climate agenda, is miles ahead of Northern Ireland. Um, they're now on their second climate action plan. Um, and their commitment and the amount of supports and, and regulation is, you know, just fails us into significance. Um, offshore is the single biggest policy uh, focus of Republic of Ireland. You know, so they're looking five gigawatts by 2030. They have seven what's called relevant status projects in, in progress. Northern Ireland abandoned its offshore a number of years ago. One thing is we don't have the same amount of sea resource that Republic of Ireland has. So that's one reason why it's never going to be quite as big. Um, but generally, um, you know, we, are, we don't have the same level of ambition and offshore just hasn't had the same policy focus um, and it can definitely deliver some of what we need. Super, thank you. Uh, Randall, I'll come to you um, for, for the next question uh, and, and it's just a straightforward ask. What, what do you see as the long-term solution for industrial high-grade heat demand? Yeah, okay. Uh, probably not a, a, an area of expertise, you know, particularly for, for, for us, but I mean, the, the general thinking probably in relation to the journey for hydrogen and low carbon fuels like that. I mean, hydrogen is going to be a, sort of quite a high end, a, a low carbon fuel. There, there's there's discussions in Northern Ireland about how it's going to be produced. Is it going to be green hydrogen from, from wind power, for instance, or you know, will we will we have blue hydrogen from steam methane reformation or will we import or whatever? At, at the end of the day, it is still going to be a high-end fuel. For things like industrial high-grade high heat and high-temperature high processing, it does look like the general direction of travel is heading towards hydrogen. You know, but, um, you know, that, as I say, the, 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 the debate's still open, uh, but that would certainly be a, a key sector or area for, for the use of hydrogen in the future. I'll just jump in, actually, John, John just on that one. Yep. We're working with, with a corporate in the Republic of Ireland called Danone. So Danone, a major uh, global um, sort of dairy company. They've, they're looking, they have an ambition um, to be completely carbon neutral by 2030. Their cork facility is a high, high grade industrial heat user north of 450 degrees to drive milk powder. And at the moment, they have no way of decarbonizing that facility. Electrification is not an option for that temperature. And they have said that unless they can get access to decarbonized gas, either biomethane or hydrogen, they're going to shut down that facility and relocate it to France where they can get biomethane gas. So industrial heating is one of the big, hard to decarbonize sectors. And if we don't have a solution locally in Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, we will actually lose you know, investment. Yeah. Interesting result. It really brings home sort of the, the, the economic impact of, of not getting this right and not getting it right in, in time. Um, this next one, uh, Russell, I was actually going to come to you on, and, and it's around carbon payback calculations. Um, so again, just when investing in renewable solutions, um, is a carbon payback calculation done each and every time? Um, the, the question goes on, but maybe, maybe you can answer that. Yeah, I, well, I, I, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's done each and every time. So the, the largest global investors in renewables, which are ultimately behind you know, a lot of the overall volume, um, if not individual number of installations, will do a fair bit of work on the carbon footprint of it, the embedded carbon and, and overall carbon savings that will generate over its life. Um, you know, I think it's, it's something that you probably need to get better at and, and, and do more of. Um, you know, overall, though, solar and wind installations are, are very heavily carbon negative, uh, carbon negative. So, um, uh, you know, it's uh, it's something that's definitely taken into account. Super, thank you, Russell. Sorry, just swapping between the Q and A function and then the chat function. There's one in here, Gavin. I, I was going to come to you on. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, maybe it was in Russell's presentation, but I'll, I'll come to you anyway, Gavin. You, you can pass the ball over to over to Russell if, if you so wish. Yeah. Uh, um, what, what would need to happen to enable widespread EV ownership and heat pump usage? And what would I expect to see happen on an average town, city, street? How is the future going to look and how do we get EV ownership and heat pump usage up? Yeah, so like it's important to say that the, those technologies can be supported today. Um, you know, heat pumps are being installed. I mean, if you look at actually kind of what's happening in the Republic of Ireland, you know, uh, a significant proportion of new builds have heat pump technologies already being installed in them as a result of building regulation. Um, EVs are kind of are growing there, uh, uh, you know, in, in traction kind of across the market as well. 
I'd say in terms of EVs, you know, everybody gives out about the public charging infrastructure and there's definitely a signal element there, but actually over 90% of charging happens in the home. So actually the issue there is kind of more about people, A, having the facility in their home, either with a driveway or a kind of a charging position that they can actually get that installed. But that in turn then for us means a reinforcement of distribution network. So we've actually got to make sure that we can provide because a combination of heat pump and uh, electric vehicle will significantly increase the level of consumption in a home, in some cases potentially double the consumption in a home. Um, you know, and obviously you're displacing the fuel costs of gas and kind of petrol, et cetera. But ultimately, we need to then make sure that we're able to actually provide that connection. And similarly with heat pumps, actually, there is a piece there about heat pumps that actually you can't just plug in a heat pump and effectively take out your gas boiler. You actually do need to look at the insulation of the home. You need to ensure that actually you've got the proper kind of water temperature in the, in the rads. You need to pressurize in the right way. So there is a bit more involved work in that. But again, those technologies are operative. They're working kind of right around the globe. We just don't tend to like them here because effectively we don't believe, for instance, on air source heat pumps, that there's any way that you can get any heat from an air source heat pump in a climate such as ours. But there is, you know, it's, it's just that's what's happening. So anyway, what would you expect to see? I mean, you would expect to see that, you know, uh, consumption will grow in individual premises. And as a result of that, we will actually have to reinforce the, the local distribution network, the connections to individual premises. And that's very much part of what we've been talking to the regulator about. Super, thank you. Well, listen, you, you, you must have convinced this next person because they're now asking, how much do you estimate it will cost to renovate a house for heat pump usage? And I guess the answer is that it, it's all specific and tailored, but any of our panelists have an estimate? Randall, have you an estimate? Look, that, that's a very good question. If we had the answer to that, would be part of the way there to solving the problem. Um, I think there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of debate around heat pumps about the level of insulation and retrofit you're going to require for a heat pump to be effective. Um, so like the early debates were around that we need a deep retrofit program and, and there were schemes in the early days. I mean, some might be able to speak better to this than in, in Ireland where there was a lot of, you know, there were like 50% grants originally, you know, for deep retrofitting and, and heat pump installations. I think there's 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 a gradual sort of acceptance that maybe those sort of deep retrofits um, and the monies that we're talking about, you know, 40, 50,000, you know, euros or whatever to retrofit a house, maybe isn't required. And I think even the Climate Change Committee recognised that. Um, I'm aware of trials that are happening in Northern Ireland and, and hopefully, I mean, uh, in, in, in things like social housing, where they're looking at hybrid systems, you know, so it's putting in a heat pump in parallel with your existing, um, you know, fossil fuel boiler. Um, and and those those trials are are looking you know quite favourable at the minute. I won't I won't try to steal the the housing executives thunder in this later because I think that they will be talking about it in the future. But you know so I think what we need to do is and uh, is is you know learn learn from where you know the heat pumps have been installed and and I think the the sample base at the minute is very much focused on new housing because the building regulations in the Republic of Ireland are basically saying you know you need to build a house at a certain grade which you know but would be suitable for heat pump installation. But um, as we start to get more and more user experience, especially in Northern Ireland of retrofits, you know, that type of equation will become, you know, we'll, we'll know the answer to that. But certainly, I, I think from, from current reports that we've seen, it's maybe not as high as we originally thought in terms of the, the fabric work that's going to be required. Super. Thanks, Randall. Listen, the, the last question here coming, coming in from the audience, um, Russell, I'll, I'll maybe pose to you. Well, I, and we, we have touched around it, but maybe just to close it out, what do you see as being the prime solution when there is no solar or wind power and there is less dispatchable plant in the future? Yeah, well, like the, the, the big hope at the moment is, is green hydrogen. Um, so, you know, we, we at the moment are, are losing about 15% of our, our wind power. We're turning off the wind turbines when we're producing it at times. We can't actually use it. You know, so, you know, just as a start, if we can actually store that, that power that we're turning off into green hydrogen and, and release it back into the system. That's certainly part of it. Um, you know, the use of renewable gas like biomethane, um, you know, is, is another part of it, battery storage. Um, so, you know, I think some of the NIE guys here will be uh, will have their own views as well. Um, but it's it's a whole system approach. Uh, there's no single answer. Super. Well, listen, I'm going to wrap things up. Uh, we have managed to cover off, I think, all unless I've missed some, all of the questions that have come in from the attendees. Uh, and I suppose, look, 
the, the number registered and, and the uh, number of questions coming in just shows how, how topical this is. What I was going to do was just go to each of our panelists um, and, and just ask for sort of a, a, a key takeaway. Um, and some of the things that I would like you to focus on whenever you're giving us a key takeaway is just, um, you know, what what for, for our attendees listening in here, um, working in, in, in their business or in their organization, what, what are the key next steps that, that they need to do? Um, what are the key opportunities coming out of this? There's, there's obviously huge challenges, but what are the key opportunities? And also maybe Russell, I'll throw in an extra one for you for good measure. Just maybe to touch on very quickly the, the uh, SECR reporting. I'm conscious that some of our members will, will be doing that for the first time under the requirements. So maybe just any tips that you have around that. So look, Randall, maybe maybe come to you in, in the first instance, just for key takeaways, particularly around next steps for our attendees listening. Yeah. Look, I, I think, um, you know, I think maybe with COP26, you know, and, and all the lead up to it, you know, the climate change agenda is very much um, in the focus, you know, even post COP, you know, it's every day in the press we're, we're talking about it. It's now got a level of debate in society, which it never had before. And I think every business is now considering their own sustainability agendas. So, like, I think in terms of next steps, you know, um, for, for business and, and for, for customers and consumers as well, is to just start that debate and, and think about how do, how do we take that responsibility on board and how do we, how do we become a carbon neutral or a carbon negative business? You know, because ultimately, you know, it's not, this is, we're not just doing this, uh, you know, necessarily to save the planet. Of course, that's, that's the climate change agenda. But there are there are real savings to be had here. There are real efficiencies and real savings to be had with a, with a bottom line benefit. So I suppose that that's the first step. You know, in terms of opportunities, you know, especially around decarbonisation, whatever your energy source, I would start that debate with your energy providers. You know, and look, look to the alternatives as well, and say how would I actually you know reduce my bills, the energy efficiency first piece, and then how how would I then decarbonise? How do I how do I get to uh, to a low carbon, zero carbon fuel or uh, energy source? Um, ultimately, as I say, you know, the, the, these will have bottom line savings. You know, it's going to be, um, you know, a, a business benefit. But I think it's, it's start those discussions. You know, start start on the energy side and and have those discussions with, you know, whoever it is providing your energy, whatever source it is. Uh, but also cast cast the mind wider uh, to to alternatives and also these new emerging markets that are opening up. We talked about the demand management. And there's a there's the real ability for large energy users and for for business to participate in that you know and 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 um, and earn additional revenues you know through participation in these new markets. Super, thanks, Randall. Russell, come to you next if that's okay, just for key takeaways or comments. Yeah, like I think the key one is every single business on this call today, every single corporate will have to respond at some point. The first question we ask people is, what's your level of ambition? You can do enough just to cover your ass, just to cover the regulations that are there. In reality, if you're going to be addressing this agenda, look at it as how can you actually create opportunity? How can you use it as a differentiator against your uh, your competitors? Uh, and that's a lot of the corporates we're working with are, are trying to go beyond just what the regulations are asking and, and use it as a differentiator. Also, if you're trying to sell this internally to your board or to your seniors, do not, you know, we're not saying that the role of businesses is to save the planet, to save turtles. Um, you know, ultimately, that's going to be the outcome. But this is primarily an economic piece. And it's to convince and to sell this concept internally on that this is an economic necessity for our business, not a not a CSR issue. Uh, and then the final thing you asked me to touch on was the uh, SECR. So that, you know, that's a fairly new regulation, which is asking corporates above 36 million of turnover, 18 million of balance sheets sort of scale to start at least quantifying their emissions of scope one and scope two in terms of carbon. What I'd say is it's a fairly low bar at the moment. Um, what we're gonna see is this is the first step of regulation. You're gonna quantify it. Use that as your baseline. <coughs> going forward, you're gonna to have to start actually disclosing how you're improving it, how you're decreasing it and your strategies. So at the moment, embrace this as, a, as an early first step. It will step up. Thanks, Russell. And Gavin, coming finally to you just for key takeaways. Yeah, I, to be honest, I'm not going to be very original after the guys. I mean, the, the kind of key piece for me is first the awareness. I mean, actually, the fact that people are showing up and are interested in this is really, really important. Uh, and secondly, that kind of piece that Russell mentioned, I think is 
this should not be seen as an imposition that this is, oh my God, you know, this is being imposed on us. This actually really does create an opportunity, an economic opportunity, uh, but also an opportunity to find a purpose, you know, for your business and for the, the activities that you're carrying out. And then the final piece, I suppose, is just important to take some action. You know, even it can be a small step, it can be, you know, as simple as kind of encouraging people to turn off the lights or as kind of a, as actively trying to kind of, you know, uh, as Randall said, looking at how your energy is produced and the kind of the pieces that go with that. I think it's just taking small steps rather than necessarily trying to do everything at exactly the same time. Get on the journey. Brilliant. Thank you, Gavin. Well, folks, it's uh, 13.46, so uh, I'm, I'm going to bring the session to a close. Um, and apologies, we did run over by a few minutes, but I do think there was some really good conversation and some good questions that it was important to address there. So, look, can I, on behalf of all of the attendees, um, thank Gavin uh, and Russell and Randall for a really good session. Hopefully it has helped to bring um, the global challenge to more of a local level um, and helped to identify some specific actions that we can take, uh, both in a personal life and within our organisations, to address the uh, issues and the challenges, but also uh, as has been mentioned, to take advantage of the opportunities. So look, thanks to all for joining us uh, and can I wish you a good afternoon. Thank you.